Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshura Nilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Purport The Brahmastra is similar to the modern nuclear weapon manipulated by atomic energy. The atomic energy works wholly on total combustibility and so the Brahmastra also acts. It creates an intolerable heat similar to atomic radiation but the difference is that the atomic bomb is a gross type of nuclear weapon whereas the Brahmastra is a subtle type of weapon produced by chanting hymns. It is a different science and in the days gone by such science was cultivated in the land of Bharata Varsha. The subtle science of chanting hymns is also material but it has yet to be known by the modern material scientists. Subtle material science is not spiritual but it has a direct relationship with the spiritual method which is still subtler. A chanter of hymns knew how to apply the weapon as well as how to retract it. That was perfect knowledge but the son of Drona Acharya who made use of this subtle science did not know how to retract. He applied it being afraid of his imminent death and thus the practice was not only improper but also irreligious. As the son of a Brahmana he should not have made so many mistakes and for such gross negligence of duty he was to be punished by the Lord himself. Srila Prabhupada in this purport addresses a common misconception that all mantras are spiritual. The Vedic literature is composed of mantras but Krishna tells Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita Trigunya Vishaya Veda the Vedas are mostly concerned with topics within the three modes of material nature. So it's, it can be said to be religious to recite the Vedas. But in many cases, or generally it's to be understood as a material recitation. A lot depends on the attitude of the performer. Everything that a non-devotee does, including his religious activities, are material because his aim is personal sense gratification or liberation. So even his going to the temple, offering arati, reciting mantras, it's all mundane. And everything a devotee does, even brushing his teeth, is spiritual because everything he does is for the pleasure of Krishna. So this is often misunderstood. What is material and what is spiritual? Material means to act for one's own sense gratification up to the standard of, up to the level of seeking impersonal liberation or even liber the, even the desire for liberation in the service of Vishnu, that's also tinged by material desire. It's not, on, it's not on the highest level of bhakti. And spiritual means to act simply for the pleasure of the Supreme Spirit, Krishna. So a non-devotee recites mantras, goes to the temple, offers arati and all these things for his own, with the aim of propitiating the Supreme Lord or the demigods or the aim of uh, performing religious activities for, for getting personal benefit. So it's material. Whereas a devotee, everything he does, even brushing his teeth, which seems like not very spiritual activity, he does that for the maintenance of the body, so that, but he only maintains the body so that Krishna may be satisfied. So that is spiritual. Of course, he doesn't. A devotee's tendency is to minimize his bodily activities and maximize those activities which are directly in the service of the Lord. So he doesn't 
for the, for the body you could spend a lot of time every day just like for instance you could spend two hours doing yoga for health that would be very good for health but a devotee doesn't do so because he has, doesn't want to spend so much time simply to maintain the body he wants to spend time serving Krishna so bodily activities are minimized and that's another symptom of a devotee's being on the spiritual platform avyartha hmm? avyartha kala that devotee doesn't waste time but he wants to utilize his time in the service of Krishna so what is spiritual and what is material the non devotees they want to make everything material what they consider as spiritual or what is spiritual they want to convert that to material that is the bane of all religious processes if you just sit to the side a bit, then you won't have your back to Prabhupada. And so many great religious teachers come and they inspire people to follow them, but within time, the, the people who are supposed to be their followers convert their spiritual teachings to material. We find that mostly what goes on in the name of religion is totally mundane. Jesus, he came, he pointed, he gave some indirect, some direction to the spiritual world. But his followers have a mundane conception. They're way ahead of, of Vivekananda. They discovered that service to the body is service to God. <laughs> Then we see, even respect we find here in South India, highly respected Vaishnava Sampradaya coming from Sripad Ramanuja Acharya. But in the temples, the people there, uh, it's not in every case, but in many cases it's taken as a job. We'll find that after taking darshan of Sri Ranganatha Swami, as you come out, then people will, there'll be one or two Brahmanas there with a receipt book. Give a donation for the temple. They're very eager to take donations. So I just discovered that they get a percentage, so they're very eager to take donations. So, so they're saying in the name of for the temple, they're collecting for themselves. Because religious institutions, they, they attract money. So money attracts people who want money. So we may find people who want money, they come to religious institutions and to make a show of being religious, to have an easy way to make money. And they won't, in, if such people will not encourage a, a, the high standard of spirituality. They, for them, Spirituality means we make a show and then people give money and we live very comfortably. So they won't encourage people who are actually interested in developing spiritual life because that makes them look bad. And uh, real spiritual life, people who are really genuinely spiritual, then uh, People who are grossly materialistic won't be attra won't be attracted to them. It, it's it's easier to it's easier to cheat people than to give the real thing. So there are many people. If you bring them in, pat them on the back, tell them you're a great devotee, and they'll be happy to give donations. But if you tell them that, well, you're just attached, you're in Maya, and all, then they won't want to give donations. So, this happened with both this and Taco that his disciples who are most expert in collecting, they were afraid to bring their contacts to Bhaktisiddhanta Sasrata because they were afraid that he would speak the truth to them. And then they wouldn't want to give donations anymore. 
So the, the aim of the institution was to preach the truth, but those who were collecting for the institution, they didn't want the truth to be spoken because that would affect their collection. So it means that they saw collection as the purpose of the institution. They didn't, that actually happened in, in some cases. There was, there's at least one instance I know of when, where one very rich man came to the Sri Gorya Mart at Calcutta and uh, he asked some questions and Bhaktisthan Sarasvati spoke in a very strong manner condemning all the people that he was, all the cheaters who he was very much attached to and he left dissatisfied although he could have himself you know, built a, a huge temple with his, with his own funds but he wasn't going to give anything after listening to Bhaktisthan Sarasvati Thakur but he, did, he didn't compromise for him because his purpose was to speak the truth. It's otherwise, uh, we come to that situation, Bhaktisthan Sarasvati Thakur also told one story of one disciple. He was instructed by his guru that you just read Bhagavad Gita. I said, okay, I'll go up to the mountain, I'll sit in a cave, and I'll read Bhagavad Gita. I said, okay. So go. So he went up to the mountain, but in the cave, but then a mouse, whenever he put his Gita down, a mouse would come to eat it. So then he went to the nearest village and found a cat. And the cat kept the mouse away. The mouse was afraid, but the cat was hungry. So I thought, oh have to feed the cat. Okay, so he went down to the village and asked someone to donate a cow. And so he was feeding milk to the cow, but looking after cows takes quite some time. So he thought, I don't have so much time for reading Bhagavad Gita, I'm so busy looking after the cow. So he went to the village and asked for a donation of a Kumari, a young unmarried girl. So he married her and he told her, you look after the cow. So. She said, okay, but you have to look after me, you know, I'm not going to live in this cave all my life. So, then he came down to the village and said, well, give me some land, I'm a Brahmin. They got some land and eventually got, the wife wasn't content with the little land and she wanted some more and the cow had more calves. And so after a few years, the guru came, he thought, let me go and find out that disciple. He went on the hill in the cave and he saw, saw it was empty and there were some people looking after goats on the hill and they said, oh, him, he'll find, you'll find him in the village. So he went to the village and he saw one huge palace with a big compound and the guards didn't want to let him in and eventually he got let in. He found his disciple sitting on a big seat as soon as his disciple came, he fell on the ground and offered full dandavans. He said, well, how come you're living in this big palace? Well, you told me to read Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, this is the result. Oh yeah, Bhagavad Gita. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I just remember. I was just going to read the other day. Yeah, he forgot the whole purpose. So much arrangements but then the arrangements became the purpose instead of the, the actual purpose which is to study Bhagavad Gita. So, it's all spiritual. Every, everything in Krishna's service, temples, presses, cars, it's all spiritual if it's used for Krishna. But it's very easy to forget and convert it back to Maya and become attached to a big building, big car. Bhaktisthan Sarasvara Thakur also said that. After getting the big marble temple in Bhagbazar, Calcutta, then he, after getting that he said, actually it was better in our old rented house. Because now we got the big marble temple, all my disciples are fighting that I should have this room, no, I should have this room. He said, it's better if we just live in a... Uh, in a less opulent situation and there was no room for anyone so they all had to go out and preach. 
Now they all have rooms, they all just want to sit comfortably in rooms. And this was the situation. Materialistic people are very expert at converting spiritual into material. The preachers of the absolute truth, they, they tell that we have to do everything for Krishna. Sangsid here, Harito Shanam. Everything should be done for the, only for the pleasure of Krishna. This is the topmost perfection of life. But mat pious, materialistic people, what's the difference between them and pure devotees? They also believe in God. They also worship God. The difference between a pious materialist and a pure devotee is that a pious materialist worships God with the intention of getting something back from Him. Whereas a pure devotee only worships Krishna for the satisfaction of Krishna. So pure devotees come to this world and they teach to do everything for the satisfaction of Krishna. But pious materialists, they, it's, it's very difficult for them to catch this point. And pious materialists are very comfortable if we preach to them that you do all your, you be very good, you be very moral, you worship God, and God will look after you. God will give you all facilities. This is the uh, principle on which America developed materially. That when the People came from Europe and after killing off most of the original inhabitants of America in the name, for the glory of God, they, uh, they developed the, what they call the Protestant ethic, that God's mercy on you is demonstrated by material prosperity. You should work hard and be moral and be good and pray to God and God will bless you by giving you lots of money. And so poverty became associated with lack of religiousness. Religion, religiousness, or to be a very religious person, was, was measured in terms of your wealth. Which is not at all, it's a totally mundane criterion. I heard one of my disciples, maybe you know him, Nityananda. He told me, he, because he's learning Tamil, so he went to one famous, supposedly Gorya Vaishnava, in, who preaches about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Tamil. And his Tamil is reputed to be very high level Tamil. So he went one time to hear him for the sake of out of curiosity to see what it's all about and also to improve his Tamil. So he went there and he found it's all Brahmins going to listen. So he gave his lecture and at the end he said to them that you should know, you see, you're all living very comfortably and you're all living very nicely, you have a very nice family life with sufficient money, so you should know this is all the blessing of Krishna. And they all thought, oh, they all thought, yes, yes, this is very nice. We all have nice, comfortable family life. This is, this is the blessing of Krishna. This is the real blessing of Krishna. Which is nonsense. <laughs> Rather that uh, comfortable, the sense of feeling comfortable in family life is the binding rope that binds us to this material world that, that that is an obstacle to developing pure devotional service to Krishna. Therefore, Kunti Devi said, Sneha Pasham Emang Chindhi. You, you cut my ties of affection to the Pandavas and the Vrishnas. Cut it. Because she, she saw this as an obstacle in developing pure devotion. But people like that. Oh, you see, we talk, we talk of praying. And 
discuss the highest ecstasies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and then go back to your blind well your, or your comfortable little pigeonhole and live very comfortably so this is very nice we'll talk of Prem and God and it's very, very wonderful and then you go back to your but re remaining in, in material attachment which means actually however much you discuss preem and ecstasy and all this <laughs> cultivating material attachment then there's no question of preem it just, it just makes it all very cheap now presently in ISKCON there's a big push towards developing our food relief and tsunami relief and people think this is wonderful this is very nice you see this is really what a religious movement should be doing. You see, you know, Prabhupada was very good, but he was a little fanatical, you know. But you know, he's, he's against Swami Vivekananda. You know, Swami Vivekananda, he, he really got the right idea. You know, Manava Seva is Madhava Seva. But this Swami Prabhupada was, he was also good, but you know, too fanatical. So it's very good that Iskon is now realizing that Swami Vivekananda was right, and we should. Feed the poor. This is the highest service. That, as one GBC member is quoted as saying, that we believe that to feed a hungry child is the greatest service one can render to Krishna. Came in the times of India. So this is very good. People love this, and they give donations, and it's wonderful, and we get lots of money, and everyone's happy, and the the government likes it. And people like it. And we can go and tell people. So for so many years they've been saying to us, what are you doing to help people? You're simply doing bhajans and telling them to chant Hare Krishna. What are you doing practically to help people? And instead of saying that, well, we're teaching them to chant Hare Krishna, which isn't really much help to people, you know, we can tell them that, yes, we have now discovered that to feed people children at school so they can study science better and then they can they can help to promote science in India and make India a superpower and have a real hope for their future we are now feeding the children in the school and they can concentrate better and they can have good careers so at last after all these years ISKCON has discovered its real purpose which is to feed hungry children at school so they can have better careers and, st and understand Darwin's theory better that we all descended from monkeys and people like it it's very good this is the real criteria this is the real criterion by which we should understand I mean in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam it says Sangsithya Hari Toshanam everything should be done for the pleasure of Hari but we have to understand that Hari is in everyone's heart and so we should simply try to satisfy the people and if the people are satisfied then Hari is satisfied I hope you don't believe all this rubbish I was just talking this is uh, I was just talking a bunch of Mayavad nonsense but it seems to have captured the way of thinking of our devotees we find in the Science of Self-Realization that in 1972 a prominent member of society in Andhra Pradesh the, the chairman of the Andhra Pradesh Drought Relief Fund sent a letter to Srila Prabhupada saying that so many people are suffering due to the drought and we are sure that your esteemed organization with its international contacts can help us to distribute food and help these and show the natural compassion and help these people. Prabhupada sent a letter back saying that this is all nonsense, you cannot help them, people are suffering due to their karma, you should come and help us spread the real welfare work which is spreading Krishna consciousness. So at that time Prabhupada could have got much support, public acclaim, government help, lots of money if they had gone and distributed prasad and done all these things. But, but rather, Prabhupada risked being rejected by these people by saying, we cannot do this. He's saying, we should distribute prasad 
Yes, we can distribute prasad, but we don't discriminate between the rich and the poor. Everyone is poor because they don't know Krishna. Everyone needs prasad. So Prabhupada set up that we should have prasad distribution at our temples. People can come and take prasad at our temples. Hungry, not hungry, they can all come to our temples and take prasad. But Prabhupada said if we concentrate on poor people, that is karma kanda. Uh, but people understand karma kanda because that's a lower platform. So then if we do that, then people will be, they'll be happy. But it's, bhakti is above karma kanda. And it's our own tendency to come down to that level also. We think that, well, we're feeding so many people and we think that, yes, we, it's something practical that we see that people are happy and they like it. Whereas if we go and tell them, if we go and preach that attachment to the body is on the level of cats and dogs, they won't like it. So, we, we tend to judge things in, in terms of what people like. But that's another kind of sense gratification. We should see what Krishna likes. We should be prepared to sacrifice our life for, for speaking and doing what Krishna wants. If we do what the public wants, then we become a member of the misguided public. Now we may say, well, we'll go and chant, we'll chant Hare Krishna and tell people to take prasad also. And uh, that way we, we'll tell, yeah, we, we, we'll combine the two things. We'll tell people it's, you know, we, we're collecting money for feeding the poor and then we'll feed the poor and we'll get them to chant Hare Krishna. So that seems like a good idea. The only thing is that we have to go and preach to the public and telling them that we're feeding the poor. And we go on talking like that, we're feeding the poor, we're feeding the poor, and then we start to believe it ourselves, that we're feeding the poor, and then we start to think, well, we have to give them medical aid and start hospitals and all these kind of things. Just like there was one movement called, there is a, a respected welfare movement called the Salvation Army, which started off as a as an evangelical movement for converting people into Christians. But they, in the Western countries, for making even the, the Christians into real Christians, what they consider to be real Christians. That means that you should actually, in between eating beef, you should pray to God. So they used to go on the streets and play instruments and sing songs to, to God on the streets of Britain. But people thought, ah, these people are stupid. And, they didn't, not many people liked them. So then they, they decided, well, apart, apart from doing our bl playing instruments on the streets and singing songs to God, we should also do some welfare activities so that people will like us. So they started feeding the poor and this and that, and people liked them. Nowadays, the Salvation Army is only known for f feeding the poor and doing welfare activities, and they don't go on the streets and sing about God anymore. <laughs> because that's what the public like and it was very successful whereas going on the street and singing about God wasn't successful the people didn't like it so they became much more popular and well accepted in society by giving up the, to a large extent giving up their spiritual content content and redefining themselves please don't lean on the stream of Bhagavatam redefining themselves as, a, as an organization for the benefit of the bodies of human beings. So people like that. And they still believe in God, but in, in, instead of being evangelical, salvation, salvation army, instead of defining salvation as, as uh, giving people a, a religious focus to their lives, now they define their salvation is to save the body. So they became redefined because in the beginning they must have been thinking, well, it's just a means. But our, in course of time, it became their aim and object. Just like the, the ma when the man got a cat to protect his Bhagavad Gita from the mouse, he was still thinking, well, this is for the Bhagavad Gita. But the, the, the very nature of mundane activities is that they're entangling and they entangle you more and more and more. And you get more and more involved, and eventually you, that's the nature of Maya. Maya takes over, and you forget what the original aim is. You've got a very nice mouth. It'd be nicer if you closed it now. 
it's considered impolite to show your open mouth to others. In Tamil culture, also. <coughs> so this is what happens. You, you, you start advertising, we're feeding the poor, and then they say, well, why don't you, uh, you know, you can also do this and start a hospital and a clinic. There's one organization called the Mayapur Vikash Sangha, which is run in Mayapur by ISKCON. And it's, the aim is to uh, help the people in the local area in, of Mayapur with, with medical aid, uh, aid and all this kind of thing. So the aim is that, uh, the I idea is that, well, by helping people in this with their practical material necessities, that they'll be more favorable to us and the government will be more favorable to us. And that would be good because we have to build a project here. So that seems pretty good. But uh, the government's idea of what's good for the people and what we, we might think is good is not necessarily the same. So through the Mayapur Vikas Sangha, the doctors hired by it are distributing condoms in, the, in Mayapur, in the Holy Dham. They're promoting illicit sex. But we can't do anything because it's a government... You know, it's a government-supported organization. And when the devotee who started this was asked about it, he's a Prabhupada disciple, he said, well, I don't see anything wrong in that. So this is what happens. You, you start doing something on the mundane platform, which is supposed to aid the spiritual, but then you get sucked more and more into mundane things, and then you change your whole outlook. I'm sure that 20 years ago, he, if he was told that, that we should distribute condoms to the inhabitants of the Holy Dham, he would have been outraged. But now, because, well, it's said that... He, anyway, I won't get into more details. But, but now, uh, he's, he's compromised. He thinks, well, that's very good. It's helping people. In, uh, in Gujarat, there's a, they, they, they brought to me one life member who they just made a devotee and they introduced. So he's a doctor. He's from the Vallabh Sampradaya, Vaishnav Sampradaya. So I said, so what, uh, what, What's your line? I, what's your specialty? He said, I'm a gynecologist. I said, that means you do abortions, right? He said, yes, that's my main business. I said, well, how can you call yourself a Vaishnava? That's just murder. He said, no, it's helping people. You see, so many girls, if they, they, have, they can't have a child before marriage. So, or the poor families, they already have three children. They, so we're helping people by, by giving abortions. This is, this is supposed to be a Vaishnava. At home, he's strict vegetarian. And he worships Lalla, the, the deity, Balgopal. But he thinks that he is helping people by murdering every day. Fifteen, twenty murders he does every day. And he's, he, according to government propaganda, this is helping people. So what happened? Balabhacharya wouldn't have approved of that. But his philosophy has become altered because he has the... His aim of life is to enjoy the senses and people get mundane education and they think that uh, everything that, yes, we have to, India has to become strong and we have a population problem, so cut, you know, this is all very good, abortion. And all, so many misconceptions. And now in ISKCON we rejected the Gurukul education that Prabhupada had so much wanted. And we've introduced, in all our schools, we have government syllabus teaching all atheism. Man has descended from monkeys. And uh, we find that even in ISKCON, now there are devotees who say that, yeah, I accept Prabhupada's spiritual teachings, but I don't accept his material teachings. I mean, obviously, he was wrong about evolution. And these are initiated devotees. Because they've compromised. And we find... Uh, it's reported on the internet that a GBC member has joined the devotee golf competition. 
So this is what happens when you start to mix the mundane with the uh, spiritual and everything becomes watered down and we think that Krishna is giving up. Krishna, his job is to sit on the altar and he gives us blessings so we can enjoy material life better. Then we become totally mundane. So sometimes people think I'm just some eccentric because I speak Actually, yeah, they say I speak very strongly, but the thing is I read Prabhupada's books and I listen to Prabhupada's lectures and Prabhupada, I just, Prabhupada said we should repeat as we've heard, so I do that. But people say it's fanatical and Prabhupada could speak like that, but you can't speak like that, although Prabhupada said we should speak like that. And practically we're seeing that because we don't speak like that, because every, everyone is simply interested in making the listeners feel happy. You are very good. You're all very nice. You're all great devotees. Isn't that nice to hear? You are a great devotee. That's nice. If I tell you, you're nonsense. You don't like to hear that, do you? But what is actually more beneficial for us? I know I'm a nonsense, but unless I tell you that you're a nonsense, then we'll all remain nonsense. And we won't be able to become advanced. Unless we distinguish reality from illusion, then we'll just take everything, everything is spiritual. This is mayavad. Chit jara saman vaivad. To make, uh, harmonize material and spiritual. Everything's, everything, everything is God. So, my doing abortion, that's also God. Everything is Everything is spiritual. Everything is... I'm so advanced, I see God in everything. So even when, I, even when I'm cutting the chicken's throat, I can see it's all God's lila. This is the way Amayavadis talk. Everything is lila. This is the rascal way they talk. You see, we're all God, and I'm human God, and this is chicken God, and I'm cutting the chicken God's throat, and that's just his lila, you see. It's all our lila. This is the way they talk, rascals, rascals. But uh, unless we clearly distinguish spirit from matter, then we'll find the same thing. Just like we have Balaji wine shop, or Saptagiri hatcheries. Isn't it? You'll find all these things. Hatchery means poultry farm. That's a, it's a name somebody sometimes use. Chicken farm. So you'll find in Andhra Pradesh, especially on this. Balaji wine shop or Sabdagiri poultry farm. Grossly sinful activities. But in the name of God. And now we have Iskon condom distribution. So how can we criticize? We're doing the same thing. So this is this is what happens if we if we try to Make the public happy, and, and the idea we will we'll make everyone feel nice, and then they'll like to, then they'll like to come to Krishna consciousness, and then we'll all be happy. But we, all right, make people feel nice, but you have to give the real teaching also. Otherwise, no one becomes strong. You don't distinguish spirit from matter, and then the Swami's business becomes to bless the child so they can get good marks at school, and become a, a good gynecologist and. All becomes all nonsense. It all becomes material, material. But people like it, and we become popular because this is what they like. That, that we we all believe in God, and God is someone somewhere, and He blesses us so that we can enjoy material life. And if there are obstacles in our enjoyment of material life, like overpopulation, I already have three children. I can't really afford one more. Then we can go to the uh, Valab abortion clinic. And the nice, kind doctor, for only 200 rupees, will uh, abort the child. And it's all service to God. Because you see, he's a Vaishnava. And I'm also a Vaishnava. But to serve Krishna better, we, you see, it's all, you have to consider all the different points and be practical. And after considering it, you know, we didn't just go to it for an abortion, but we considered everything very carefully. And we thought we could serve Krishna better if we didn't have any more children. So, uh, we had an abortion. And it's all spiritual. 
These things are, well, I didn't hear anyone explain it like that, but that's, that's the way things are going. Manava Seva is Madhava Seva. We're, we have a school in Vrindavan and we're teaching all the children so they can become computer engineers and their whole Vrindavan culture which they followed for thousands of years looking after the cows, they won't want to do that because they're all going to become computer engineers now. We're helping them make progress. And we're, up, we're empowering the women of Vrindavan so they won't want to help look after cows and put cow dung on their head and they'll all become liberated and divorce their husbands and run off to Delhi. So we're helping we're giving them modern education and in this way. But they all chant Hare Krishna, you see. But we're, we're taking them to the school and we're educating them and we're teaching them Bhagavad Gita shlokas and they all chant Bhagavad Gita shlokas and they'll all go off to the city and become empowered. And they'll chant Hare Krishna. So you see, that's better, isn't it? So we're, we're doing something to help people materially so they can get good jobs. And they're also chanting Hare Krishna. But, but what... What is there chanting Hare Krishna? Sai Baba, his followers also chant Hare Krishna. But what is the concept that comes along with it? It's totally demoniac that this rascal Sai Baba is God. So you can get, you can get people to chant Hare Krishna by offering them material benefits, but they'll take it as a mundane process. That we chant Hare Krishna and God helps us. Krishna helps us to get a good job and to get a better husband than the present one and all this kind of thing. So... Uh, it may seem that we're spreading Krishna consciousness and it's better. More and more people are chanting Hare Krishna. But chanting Hare Krishna, but they have to understand why to chant Hare Krishna. Otherwise, it's not chanting Hare Krishna. And you, you'll open some hospital and say, well, this hospital is for... It, this is a spiritual hospital because here we have only devotees. But in, in due course of time, it will just revert back to a mundane hospital. Just like you, you have... In uh, Madras, there's the Vaishnav College, right, isn't there? Is it, what's spiritual about that? Anything nowadays? It's just, it's just the name is Vaishnav College. It was originally started with the... I, I can imagine it was started with the idea that Vaishnavs would go and you'd teach them secular subjects and they'd all learn secular subjects and at the same time be Vaishnavs. But because you put in the poison of secular subjects, that's the purpose, is to teach secular knowledge. And so the, uh, the, the, the Vaishnav, instead of putting Vaishnavism first, prapanna, prapatti, surrender to God, they thought, well, how to, how to put the two things together? But this is chit jara saman trying to put spiritual and material together. And the result is that everything becomes converted to material because, you see, we're teaching, we're teaching secular subjects, mundane subjects, and we're also doing a little omnamo narayanaya here and there. And, uh, but that's not really the purpose. The purpose is to teach secular subjects. So the omnamo narayanaya becomes less and less. And in the end, just the name of the college is Vaishnav College. So that's what it is. I mean, the, the midday meals program, the, the, it's, it's, you, someone, kami driver, drives up, dumps off the the food, which might have been cooked by someone who's a chanting Hare Krishna, maybe, maybe not, that doesn't matter. The thing is the food has to get cooked. He dumps it off and they feed it. Uh, no, one, no one knows it's prasad. Or it's supposed to be prasad, maybe it's prasad. But the, the aim is to feed children so they can have a better mundane education and uh, make money. <laughs> Two leaders of Iskana, why are you studying this Monday? this Monday meals program, midday meals program, they both replied to make money. <laughs> so it's a kind of cheating. We say we're helping the public, but actually it makes money because you charge them six rupees for a plate and it only costs you three rupees and you do several thousand plates a day. That's easy profit. But easy profit means it will be misused for mundane purposes. It's not done for the satisfaction of Krishna. So, therefore, the Bhagavad Shastra should be preached in an exacting manner, so that we can, please don't sit with your back to Prabhupada, in a manner that people can clearly differentiate between spirit and matter. Spiritual life begins with differentiating spirit from matter. 
Therefore we find in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna teaches Arjuna, what is the difference between the body and the soul? And we find that Prabhupada was teaching this all the time, again and again and again. Because it's so easy for us to take the chanting and take the buildings of the temples and take the prasad district and convert it all back to material. Very, very easy. Because it's, it's easy because to actually stand for the truth and, and state that everything in this material world stinks. It's all, unless it's done, everything in this material world, unless it's done for the satisfaction of Krishna, it's all simply a cause of bondage. So, to establish that means to constantly struggle throughout our lives we can't, if we're actually to preach the truth, we can't expect that the public will like it. Because the public is dedicated to forgetting Krishna. The public is dedicated to sense gratification. At best, pious sense gratification. So it's much easier for us to go along with it, to chant Hare Krishna and be mundane. It's much easier, especially you see, we also have our children and we're thinking how they can become a gynecologist or a computer engineer and all these things. It's much easier to fit into society than to go against it. Now our aim is not to go against society. We're not deliberately trying to upset people, but our aim is to establish within society that Krishna consciousness is the supreme absolute truth and that means acting in a manner for the satisfaction of Krishna, which is different to acting for the satisfaction of the, mund the, of the mundane bodies of people. And if we actually try to establish that, then we can expect that many people won't like it. And that actually should be a... that's almost a test of, of whether we're preaching properly or not. If people don't like it, Many times you say, oh, so many people came and they liked it. But they liked it, but they liked what? <laughs> Are they, it's good if people like Krishna consciousness and they say this is, good, this is good, but they should understand why it's good. Otherwise, if we're simply interested in people saying that we're good, then we have to compromise and become become part of them. So our Krishna conscious movement is meant for giving a, a different understanding. It's not simply that, just like there's one bumper sticker in America, chant Hare Krishna and be vegetarian. <laughs> the Krishna conscious movement is not meant to be a vegetarian version of the Ram Krishna mission. <laughs> it's, it's much more than being a vegetarian. Our aim is not to make people vegetarian. People think, oh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> but uh, being a vegetarian is a long, long way from being Krishna conscious. Hitler was a vegetarian. So, one can be totally mundane and be a vegetarian. Buddhists, some of them are vegetarian. Not all of them, most are not. But uh, they're also vegetarian. But they're... they're uh, Philosophy is totally atheistic. So, differentiating between the material and the spiritual, that is the... We can say that's practically the most... That, that is the basis of Krishna consciousness. That is the most important duty of a Vaishnava. That is the intrinsic duty of a Vaishnava to understand the difference between the material and the spiritual. And if we don't understand that, then our apparently spiritual activities will be material. And if we do understand that, then our apparently material activities will be spiritual. But it's very easy to confuse the two. Or even if in the beginning we do something which is supposed to serve the spiritual, but if it's leaning towards the material, just like feeding the poor, Prabhupada said that, if we concentrate, even if it's prasad, if we concentrate on feeding the poor, that will be karma kanda. Because the, the, if we're feeding the poor, then the aim and object is to 
is primarily if we're going, we're saying, well, we're feeding the poor, but we're feeding them prasadam. But if, if we're going to the poor, that means we're primarily doing it for a materi- on a, due to a material consideration. We're primarily doing it because they're hungry. And the fact that it's prasadam is secondary. That's why Prabhupada said it becomes karma kanda. That's why Prabhupada said we should distribute prasad to everyone. Everyone is poor, spiritually poor. The rich people are also poor. But if we distribute primarily to the poor, well, they'll be more enthusiastic to take it. Not that they're hungry, but then they'll save money to buy uh, toddy. They, they use that word toddy here. It's also used here. It, toddy is a word for, it means uh, homemade whiskey or something like that. Distilled. So the poor people, they're also not... It's not that they're not eating, but they're happy if you feed them because they, they can, then they, they can have an extra bottle of toddy and save money for that. So uh, to concentrate on feeding the poor, that will be karma kanda. Then the aim is not so much to, de- to benefit people spiritually as to benefit the maturing. You say, well, you see, they're also taking prasad. And we also get them to chant Hare Krishna, but we brought in a material consideration. That we're, we're specifically distributing to the poor. We're specifically targeting poor people. So Prabhupada's process was, yes, he would also distribute to the poor, but primarily at our temples. He built a big pavilion in Mayapur so people could come and take prasadam at the temple. And it's never that it's only for the poor. Everyone should come. Everyone should come and take prasada. So, Hare Krishna. Is there any question about this? Tsunami victims are asking for they're asking for fishing nets. All our the, the fishermen, our fisher fishing nets got washed away. So we have enough food, the, the, the food was rotting. There so so many organizations tripping up over each other to get good publicity by feeding the tsunami victims. They had no shortage of food, but they said, we need new fishing boats and fishing nets. So we're going to give it to them? No? Well, maybe you will, because you see, we have to make a good impression on the public. And if we cooperate with the government agencies, then we have to go along with what the government says. If we start feeding, if we start doing midday meals, probably in Tamil Nadu, then Amma may tell us to, they have to give one egg a day. Right, isn't it? Here in Tamil Nadu. One egg a day for the school children. She's a, she's a Sri Vaishnav Brahmin, but she's discovered that we have to give the school children one egg a day. So that's what you cooperate with the government, and the government will say, oh, Iskon, you're doing very good food relief. Now give one egg a day also. And you give one egg a day. Oh, I don't see anything wrong with that. They're also getting prasada. If we didn't give them one egg, then anyway they'd be eating food. So let's give them prasada along with it. And maybe we can offer the egg also. You never know. It's vegetarian, right? Now they're promoting vegetarian eggs. So that's also vegetarian. I, see, so. I mean, if... Uh, if, if we can distribute condoms in Mayapur, then why can't we distribute eggs in Tamil Nadu? What's the harm? Yes? Yeah, you can say like that. Yes, yes. You can tell people, come to the temple, you'll be happy. Yes, we can say like that. But that shouldn't remain on that platform forever that you just make people feel good and be nice to them. Yeah, sure, we should be nice to people. We're not saying that you have to shout at people and scream at them. But, but it's not that it remains like that all the time, that someone comes and they're initiated and they still believe that Manava Seva is Madhava Seva. Who's going to tell them? If someone's coming for initiation, they should know well before that that all these so-called swamis are nonsense, they're all bogus, and they should not only know as a matter of fanaticism, but they should know on the basis of philosophical understanding. Otherwise, what happens is you see people, even they're initiated, and some famous 
bogus Swami comes through who speaks very sweetly on Krishna Leela, but who's actually a Mayavadi, and everyone goes to all the initiated devotees, they go to listen. Oh, he's also very... You see, he's only speaking about Krishna in between the tea breaks. Recently, some devotees, they told me that uh, in one place, they all went to some, some Swami came. No, not Swami, he's Grihastha, with the name Goswami. And uh, they all went to listen to him. Because they said, well, he's from the Nimbak Sampradaya. You see. So what's wrong? He speaks very nicely about Krishna, tells so many nice stories, and sings a little bit, ah, in between. And everyone liked it. We all liked it. So that means it must have been bhakti, because we all liked it. And we all felt so happy to hear all these stories. So then I just asked them, you see, is this guy drinking tea? Well, I suppose so. He can't even give up drinking tea. And how are you going to benefit from listening from him? None of them initiated devotees. None of them had the sense to think. Basic thing. That means they're not trained properly to, under, to differentiate between what is actually spiritual and what is material. It's not that everyone who comes and speaks about Krishna that it's spiritual. They're doing for name, fame and money. Money. So there might be some resemblance of bhakti there, but the main intention is to get name, fame and money. And it's a good way of doing it because people like, pious people like to hear about Krishna. The, two, he's, the, the speaker may not be thinking like that, but in his own manner of thinking, his bhakti has become completely mixed up with his own family maintenance and his uh, popularity. So he, think, he thinks and his, and his audience think, this is all bhakti. And the proof is that we heard the nice stories and we laughed and sometimes we cried. You see, it really touched our hearts. But if it really touched your heart, then uh, he should, why is he drinking tea? Why is he attached to something so mundane? He takes the money and maintains his family lives very comfortably. So, he, they, they have no differentiation between what's actually spiritual and what's mundane. They think that we're doing bhakti and Krishna is looking after us. You see, we have a nice house and a nice car and I just, I just spent 50 lakhs getting my daughter married and it's all oh, Krishna's, Krishna's so merciful. And we're building temples, but temples to preach what? Come and see the Lord and go back home and drink tea. Where's the advancement? No one will preach Vairagya Vidya. So, uh, we have to have a very clear understanding of what is actually mundane and what is spiritual. Then they'll criticize, you see, well, sannyasis, they're also living very comfortably. They get fed very nicely wherever they go. Maybe, you have to see, a sannyasi is not doing it for his own mundane sense gratification. But if a sannyasi is going to accept nice food and all these things, then he has to do his duty of speaking in a manner that people are spiritually benefited. When Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, <coughs> one time he, he was in Rajamandal and he heard that one local priest had said that Raghunath Das Goswami, he is a Shudra because he came from a non-Brahmin caste. So he uh, said, we can give blessings to him because we are, f we are from the Brahmana caste and Raghunath Das is from a lower caste. So when he heard of this great... Now, uh, previous to this, Bhaktisthan Saraswati had come in a car to Vrindavan, which no sadhu would ever do such a thing in those days. Sadhu means they walk barefoot here and there. He'd come in a car, very nicely dressed, and they say, this is against the principles of Rupa Goswami. He said, I'm coming to teach you how to follow Rupa Goswami. So they couldn't understand this. And then he heard about this and he started fasting. And then all his disciples had to fast also. They were all fasting. So then the news came back to this panda. And he uh, came and he apologized. And he said, yes, I shouldn't have said that about Raghunath Das Goswami. And 
Bhakti Siddhan Sarasar Sar, Thakur, he said, yes, yes, all right, that's all right. And then he again took prasad. And then one of <coughs> Bhakti Siddhan Sarasar Sar, Thakur's leading disciples asked him, that why did you start fasting and make such a fuss? He's just a foolish man, and he said something. And you, know, you, could, you could have just forgotten it. Bhakti Siddhan Sarasar Sar, Thakur said, I am accepting the honor of an acharya and the facilities of an acharya. So if I do not act as an acharya by establishing what is the proper behavior of a Vaishnava that we, we cannot tolerate the insults to our acharyas, then, uh, then my coming in a car and all this would be simply false. Then it would be for my own sense enjoyment. I have to act as an acharya, not simply accept the facility. Then it becomes mundane. Then that's true. If we, if we simply accept facilities, but we don't differentiate between spirit and matter, if we, if we don't teach what is the actual path of Krishna consciousness, then we become open to that charge that we're building nice temples for our own sense enjoyment. Prabhupada said that in Mayapur. He, said, he saw very few devotees who were in the class. He said, well, they're, well, they're busy doing this and they're doing that. And, Prabhupada said, if you don't come to hear the Bhagavatam, then in, in a short time, this temple will become a home for pigeons only. Just like you see so many temples in South India. They're full of bats. You know what's a bat? A bat means it's like a flying mouse. And it's full of, the temples are full of bat stool. Because hardly anyone ever goes there. Because there's, there's no preaching. There's no... Preaching means someone may be telling some stories, this, that, but then people will think, well, there's nice stories about Krishna, but there's better entertainment on TV. So why should I go to the temple? Or if they teach that, uh, well, you just be good and do good and feed the poor, people think, well, they do that in the Ram Krishna mission also, but they don't tell me to give up coffee and tea, so... Why should I come to Isco? I can go to I can come to I can do the same thing there. So because they they stopped systematic education on what is actually Krishna conscious, then people stopped coming and the temples became empty. So for it may be that we'll get lots of money for a short time, but without the blessings of Krishna, then we then uh, we can't maintain our principles. And once you compromise, you have to compromise further and further and further. So already ISKCON is distributing condoms in the Holy Town. It's come to that. Sorry to hear, but these are facts. Yeah, you have something to say? Sugar-coated pill. Often use that anecdote. Uh, not very often, actually. I didn't hear Prabhupada. I didn't hear Prabhupada saying that very often. It's not a common simile that Prabhupada used. So you can give sugar-coated pill, but don't just give sugar. The, the medicine has to be there. If you only give sugar, then that's cheating. So we're all. It's easy to give sugar. Why sugar-coated pill? It's easy to give sugar. But when are you going to give the medicine? How and when you have to draw the line? When you see that uh, we're distributing condoms, you know we've crossed it. <laughs> but that is not the, the state of affairs and the upgrade where it is received. That's why I'm giving this, that's why I'm speaking like this. I have more CDs with more lectures like this also, if you want more explicit information. Because the tendency in, of, after any great spiritual teacher comes is, to, is for his followers to gradually compromise. And that's going on in our ISKCON today. And if I say like this, I won't be very popular. I might get censured by our leadership. But if I don't say it, then our, our movement will totally go to hell. It's already going to hell. So, I'll speak like this as, unless and until I get thrown out of ISKCON or whatever. But or better that ISKCON comes back to its own principles. 
They may say, well, it's just an isolated incident and we'll change it. But how did it come to that? How did it come to such a sinful situation? Because we're not preaching like Prabhupada preached. We're not speaking the truth. We're, we're, we, are, we allow compromise. The result is it goes from one thing to another. So see what Prabhupada did. See what's Prabhupada's example. Then you'll see where to draw the line. Prabhupada, he didn't act... He, Prabhupada didn't... It wasn't a Prabhupada always when he saw people, he chastised them. It wasn't like that. But he always spoke the truth. He always told, you're not the body. You have to... He always gave a wholly transcendental idea of Krishna consciousness. He never told, yes, yes, we're feeding the poor. When people came like that, he told that... this. He said, feeding the poor is... This Ram, what's his name? Jetla Mani, what's his name? Ram Jet, was it Jetla Mani is his name? Jetmalani, Jetmalani, is it? Yeah, he came, he was a big shot even in those days, he was a well-known person. So he asked Prabhupada, that, what are you doing in it for welfare work? And Prabhupada said, welfare work is the business of cats and dogs. He told him. Because it's just... It's just on the bodily platform, the cat and dog platform. Prabhupada told him outright. Is that what you say when people ask? When people ask you, what are you doing to help the public, what do you tell them? We don't also plant. No. So you're not following Prabhupada in that respect. We are not in the world as you're not empowered, therefore you, beca- you lose the power to practice Krishna consciousness altogether. If you don't have faith in his words, that you want to... You don't, what power do you need? You simply have to open your mouth and say it. You have the muscles, you have the tongue, but you don't have the desire. You don't have the faith, so you don't say it. Because you're thinking, well, if, if, if we say like that, they won't like it. It means you're more concerned with pleasing the public and with pleasing Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. His divine grace, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna.